we got okay. time, so I'm starting the recording. There we go. And I'm going to start the All right, and then I'm going to click this button here that shares my screen. There we go. I'm going to click that button that makes this thing smaller, and I'm going to click this button that makes it bigger. Nice. And then it's just like Alice in Wonderland. All right, so Sierra, can you hear me, and can you see Sounds stuff? Sounds good. Yep, I All see right. stuff, and I hear you. Okay, so I should probably let everyone know on um, that whole Twitter thing where I'm like, this is a sample of SANS 504. Yeah, that wasn't authorized by the SANS Institute. Um, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to think that they're okay with it. Um, but as I say on the slide, if I, if I disappear, if somebody could please send help, <laughs> uh, that, would be, that would be really awesome. Um, and SANS is a bunch of great people, but uh, I, I don't know. There's a lot of people at SANS now. I mean, they've increased, like, they've got, like, 100-some employees, and I don't know if any of them have ties to the mafia. So, yeah, if I, if I wind up dead, um, it's time to start the investigation, right? So um, thank you very much for attending, everybody. Um, this is uh, John Strand. We have Sarah on the line. Say hi, Sierra. Hey, guys. How's it going? And as usual, Sierra will be taking the questions, filtering out those questions, and, um, and then asking me the questions at various key opportune times throughout this webcast. So uh, what, what is this? What are we doing here? So I've said it many, many, many times to my students whenever I take a class. These webcasts are, are two separate things for me. One, it allows me to do research on specific topics that I find interesting. Um, number, that's number one. Number two, um, I can take this, the stuff that I find interesting, like man in the middle attacks, and I can update SANS 504. And number three, it's a way for me to basically make sure that my students uh, that I take that take 504 get an opportunity to get the updated material as I add new things into the class. A lot of the stuff that we do in webcast, not all, but a lot of the stuff that we do in webcast shows up in 504. So if anybody is ever talking like SANS is expensive, yeah, no question it's expensive, but it's not just that specific class that you take. It's also all of these extra webcasts that you kind of get thrown on for free as well. And to be honest, they're free to anybody. It's not just SANS 504 students, but, uh, but in all honesty, it's just a way for me to constantly give back to the community, especially the people that have been so awesome to us over the past few years. So let's go ahead and let's get started. This is brought to you by SANS 504, Hacker Techniques, Exploits, and Incident Handling. Go ahead and check that out. In fact, this entire section is going into SANS 504, Hacker Techniques, Exploits, and Incident Handling. It's pretty cool. It's also brought to you by Black Hills Information Security. I love this quote. Uh, Sierra's working on a t-shirt right now. It says, so people hire you to break into their places to make sure that no one can break into their places. And Bishop from the movie Snickers, Sneakers says it's a living. Uh, follow us on Twitter at bhinfosecurity. Um, also, you can shoot us an email, consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com, because we do this stuff for a living. We do pen testing and break into places to make sure that other people can't break into those places. Enough with the advertising. Let's move on. Um, so this freaked me out. I, 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 I tweeted this, and I, I don't know what freaked me out more, the fact that this actually popped up or the fact that, uh, well, there's a couple of things. Either A, the fact that this exists, B, the fact it took me so long, or C, the responses I got from people. And, yeah, this actually applies to this webcast quite, quite a bit. So before I even logged into my computer system, I noticed there was a little wireless icon. And I clicked on the little wireless icon, and it gave me the ability to turn on and off airplane mode, gave me the ability to connect to any wireless access points that I wanted to without authenticating to the box. Um, and the little wireless access point 2, w, or wireless AP2, is the one that I have in my office. You can see a bunch of wires and junk behind me. Um, Fortinet in the upper right hand corner. There's a whole bunch of junk that I have in here, but that wireless access point too is an outright hostile wireless access point. It is just evil, complete pure evil. And yeah, I could totally join it before authenticating to the system. So I tweeted this out. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And um, Microsoft, or not Microsoft, a bunch of people pointed out, um, and it's a justifiable point, that the way authentication works today in Microsoft is it actually tries to connect out to your Microsoft account or whatever account you registered with, like Microsoft Live or whatever they're calling it these days. And um, it does authentication remotely to make sure that you can actually log into your system. So you need to have the ability to actually join a wireless access point before you even authenticate because your authentication is many times bound to that wireless access or to that uh, account that it needs to be able to access the cloud, quote unquote, 
to authenticate you. Is there anything that I said that sounds like that's a good idea? Uh, period. I mean, the <laughs> can join a network before I even authenticate. One person pointed out to me, they're like, well, also remember that somebody could plug your computer into an Ethernet adapter and you would have no control over that. That's a valid point as well. But I think the whole wireless angle is far more terrifying uh, to me. So this actually applies to this whole entire man in the middle theme that we're going to have over the next few slides because it's just so very, very wrong. All right, so as I said, this is out of the, uh, the uh, SANS 504 class. You can see the entire roadmap. We're not going through absolutely everything um, on this slide. We're just going to be looking at the uh, passive and active sniffing. This is a section from day three. Um, you can see all the different things that we talk about there as well. So let's talk about sniffing a little bit. We've got to set the stage. One of the things I, I think that is very, very important, anytime you're looking at concepts like LLMNR poisoning or NetBIOS poisoning attacks or DNS cache poisoning or ARP cache poisoning is you have to actually understand how the protocol itself actually flies. So let's go back in time a long time ago. It used to be that if somebody was on a hub or even many wireless networks, not all, but a lot of the wireless networks that exist today, if I send out a packet, if I send out anything, communication from my computer system, every other computer system can see that communication and uh, sniff it. Um, it just sniff it. It's a common broadcast domain. Everyone can see everyone else's traffic. So life is good. We have nothing to worry about except for the fact that somebody could be running a sniffer, as denoted by our evil little black hat guy um, there on the left-hand side. On modern networks and uh, modern switch networks, the traffic that is sent is usually sent to just the specific system that it was intended to be sent to. Now I say usually because a huge part of this presentation that we're going to go over is going to entail how we can actually break that completely apart. Now this can be a physical switch. It can also do uh, client isolation on many wireless networks where the clients on the wireless network can't see all the traffic to each other. So if a bad guy is sitting there trying to sniff on the network, they're not going to be able to get as much out of that wireless um, network as you would expect on an older wireless network or even going way back in time with the hub. Now, when we're sniffing in like a common broadcast domain, we could use tools like Wireshark. I want to make it very clear we are not going to talk about Wireshark for the duration of this presentation. I'm just bringing it up because Wireshark is fantastic. If you haven't used it, you should be using Wireshark. I've been thinking about doing some webcasts for Wireshark, but I, I don't know. It, it just doesn't a lot of people that know how to use it use it, and the people that don't know how to use it, there's tons of resources online. But it's a great sniffer and a protocol parser, so check it out. Um, so let's start breaking down a couple of different things so we understand how these attacks are actually playing out. All right. So if you type in a domain like www.counterhack.net, all right. So that is a domain. Your computer system has no clue whatsoever what counterhack.net is. None at all whatsoever. It just basically is completely lost. So in order to figure out what counterhack.net means, because that means something to you, we want to make it something that's actually useful for your computer to understand. It's going to use DNS to resolve that uh, name to an IP address. An IP address is like it's almost like a postal address for a computer system. You know, on your on your postal address, you have the country, the state, the zip code, the city, and the street and the address. It's kind of how an IP address actually works, but with numbers, right? So we've got the dotted quad associated with it. If we're on the same network as another computer system and I want to talk to another IP address, let's say I'm talking between 10.1.1.1 and 10.1.1.2, then my computer system is going to have to drop down and, and talk at layer 2. And it's going to send out something called an address resolution protocol request or an ARP request. Now that ARP request is going to be sent out to the broadcast address, which means it's going to be um, pushed out to absolutely every system on that network segment. So it sends out this address resolution protocol request, hits every single system, and ideally, in a perfect, wonderful world, only the system that has that IP address is going to respond back with their MAC address, their media access control address. Now, a MAC address is a globally unique identifier, quote unquote, putting little stars next to it, that is unique to every single computer system's network interfaces. So every network interface in the world should have a completely unique 
global identifier called a MAC address. Now I know there's people already freaking out this can be attacked. You can do MAC spoofing very very easily using ifconfig with hardware ethernet adapter addresses. You can do it with NetSH. You can change your MAC address to be just about anything that you want it to be. But the way it's supposed to work is that every single system has a unique MAC address. So whenever I'm trying to talk to uh, one from one IP to another IP address on a switch I'm going to send out an address resolution protocol. I'm going to get a response back from the system. It's going to say its MAC address is here and it's associated with a specific IP address. And then the systems can talk to each other and life is good, right? So there's no way that this is dangerous at all. Isn't it awesome to know that these protocols, DNS and address resolution protocol, are the most secure protocols on the entire internet? At which point, uh, the listener that said on Twitter, he's eating, running on a treadmill and listening to me, like choked on his food, fell on his treadmill and got shot into the back wall because he's like completely shocked I said something so incredibly stupid. No, these in fact are not the most secure protocols on the internet. In fact, these are the most insecure protocols on the internet. If I could be on the same network as you and I can communicate to your systems, these protocols are straight up open game. So let's talk about that MAC address, um, IP address mapping via ARP. As I said, this is done through address resolution protocol. So you're going to send out an ARP request. It's going to get that 48-bit unique globally or globally unique identifier for the system that you're trying to communicate with, and they're going to talk to each other, and life is good. And it'll cache the system for a period of time, sometimes up to 10 minutes. But we need to make sure that we have that mapping. Now, this becomes exceptionally important when you're talking about certain IP addresses that everybody has to talk to. This is something called the gateway. We're going to talk about that gateway a little bit. In your house, this would be your wireless router. At work, this would be your router as well. Leaving the switch network and then routing out to the rest of your network or communicating out to the internet, that's going to go through your gateway. So whenever we're talking about these man-in-the-middle style tools, trying to become that gateway becomes exceedingly, exceedingly important. So how do we do something like ARP cache poisoning? So the tools we'll talk about, better cap, man in the middle framework, they support something called gratuitous ARPs. A gratuitous ARPs, which sounds kind of nasty and dangerous, doesn't it? Uh, whenever I say things like gratuitous ARPs around small children, their parents cover their ears. So whenever we talk about gratuitous ARPs, um, I can go up to your computer system and I can say, hi, how you doing? I am 10.1.1.1. I know that's the IP address for your gateway. Um, by the way, my MAC address is here, and I got AABBCCDDEFF. I can give you that MAC address of my interface. And whenever we're running tools like ARP spoof, it, it basically continues to do this. It's, 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 it's just continuous. It just keeps going. It just keeps going and trying and trying and trying again. It's, still, it's a lot like a rapid seven salesman. It just does not give up. It just keeps on calling, going to your system saying, I'm at this IP address, I'm at this MAC address, I'm at this IP address, I'm at this MAC address. It sends it every like second or so if you're using something like ARP spoof. And eventually it makes it through. And in that particular situation, your Windows target or your Linux target has now cached that the gateway is now you, the evil bad guy. And instead of sending the traffic out to the gateway, which is kind of like the doorway going to the wide open internet and the rest of the network, he's going to send all of his traffic through your computer system. And now I can do that type of redirection. A little bit more background on some of the protocols we're going to talk about today. More name resolution. See, there's a problem. Beyond DNS, on Windows systems, you have something called link local multicast name resolution. Um, that is an absolute mouthful. It's called LLMNR. Um, even trying to shorten it down, LLMNR, is actually kind of a mouthful. It's kind of feel like you have marbles in your mouth trying to say LLMNR. And uh, what happens is on, on networks with Windows computer systems, whenever it doesn't get a name resolved from DNS, um, so let's say that we're trying to look up uh, supersasquatch.com. Actually, it's come up with a domain that doesn't exist. Let's say supersasquatch. Uh, 52, 56, 12, 14.com. That system does not exist. So what's going to happen is it's going to try to resolve it through DNS. DNS is going to come back and be like, look, you're smoking crack. I don't even know what the hell that is. I have no response for you. Then your Windows computer system reaches out to its brothers and sisters that are next door, and it says, hey, do any of you guys know where Super Sasquatch 527916.com is um, or a specific host name? And uh, they'll receive this request. And if they know the answer, they're going to give it. 
If they don't know the answer, they're not going to give it. And that becomes a huge problem. Um, and we'll talk about how we can break that down a little bit later whenever we talk about tools like Responder. But it's querying local systems blindly on the network saying, hey, do you guys happen to know where this is at? Um, and if it doesn't find it with LLMNR, it's then going to switch over to NetBIOS name service, which is denoted as MBT-NS throughout the rest of this presentation. So it's basically like, I couldn't find this, can you help me? And it'll accept random answers from any freaking random stranger that's on the network. So it, it's basically like, imagine that you have a computer system, it drives up, it's got this van, it's, a, it's rusty, it has wheels falling off, the dude looks like a failed carny, and whenever you're a failed carny, you have truly failed at life, my friends, and on the side of the van, it has Hannah Montana party bus, your computer basically goes to that that guy in the van and is like, yo, I'm trying to get to this and it's just going to accept any candy that scary dude in the van gives it. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to be giving out scary, horrible, horrible, horrible candy. Because this can be triggered anytime someone mistypes domains or they mistype a host name or a host that no longer exists on the network and it's going to scramble to try to find that system again and again. Yeah, we're going to be able to take advantage of that here in just a little bit. So if we want to mess with the data link layer, we actually have some tools at our disposal that make this easy. I, I don't want to like, like mislead you guys into thinking these are the only tools that do this. Um, there's lots of tools that do this type of thing, but these are the main ones that we're going to be targeting whenever we're talking about address resolution protocol at the data link layer. Um, the first one is called BetterCap. Um, becoming a huge fan of BetterCap simply from the perspective that it has excellent documentation. It installs and it works. Their instructions for getting it up and running on like Ubuntu 16.04 works every single time. They do DNS cache poisoning on systems on the fly. Very, very clean syntax for the uh, file. I wish it was standard host syntax, but you know, beggars can't be choosers at all. Um, we'll talk about BetterCap. And then ARP spoof is kind of the old stalwart. It's part of that, that DNS suite of utilities uh, that Doug Song released years ago. In fact, a lot of tools that you see today that do this uh, like kind of ARP cache poisoning style attacks, um, it, is, it is fantastic because a lot of them are still using a tool that was released like back in the 90s, right? So Doug Song's tool persists to this day. It just works and it works really, really, really well. And as I said, it's part of a wider suite. Hey, uh, Sierra, do you have any questions? Hey, uh, let me see. I don't think so. Okay. Um, no, there's no questions yet. So if you guys want to ask questions, you can you can ask them. Oh, they're waiting. They're waiting. To <laughs> I know, and then uh, they're gonna bomb me with like ten million at the same yeah, time. Right at the end. <laughs> you know, they're. I think they're still digesting the Hannah Montana party bus comment with the failed. It is party. pretty hilarious. <laughs> so, all right. So. Okay. Um, our spoof is one of those things that's definitely at that uh, at the heart of a lot of tools. The next tool is Man in the Middle Framework, um, written by one of my absolute all-time favorite security researchers today is Byte Bleeder. Um, he's the guy that took GCAT from BHIS and made it into a full-fledged, super awesome toolkit. Um, really like his work, and this framework is is fantabulous. Um, in fact, you're going to see it brought up again and again and again. Supports ARP cache poisoning, multiple other injection TCP stream modification attacks as well. So let's get a visual of how this all rolls. So the first thing in step one, the bad guy is going to configure IP forwarding to send packets to the default gateway of the LAN. Now, the reason why is because if I'm going to pretend to be a router, I darn well better be a router myself because we don't want the traffic to just end up at us as, as a dead end. We want to be able to see that traffic go through our computer system and flow out to the default gateway. And I need to add in the command to actually enable this, but it's like, like echo one and proc net syst and then IP forward, I think is the path. And it enables that IP forwarding capability on your network interface. Uh, the second step is to send out those gratuitous ARP responses, those unsolicited responses, you know, once a second, basically sending it out to redirect data from the default gateway to the attacker's machine. At this point, I'm going to have a sniffer that's going to be running. And we're going to talk about those sniffers here in just a couple of seconds. At this point, the victim would then send their traffic, which would normally go directly to the default gateway at the bottom of the slide. But instead, it's going to go through kind of a meteor, right? It's going to go through me. I'm going to be that, that monkey in the middle or man in the middle where the traffic's going to be forwarded through my computer system, and I will forward it out to the default gateway. But I'll be able to sniff everything that's going on in between it as well. So uh, dsniff components, there's a couple of different uh, tools that are very, very good available. Um, 
So if we actually want to go about messing with the TCP layer, uh, what can we actually do? Well, turns out we could use man in the middle framework. Sorry, I'm editing my slides on the fly. There we go. Turns out we can use something like inject malicious files and content into the TCP stream while it's going across. Man in the Middle Framework has this capability. Um, one of, it's got a couple of different things that are just really, really cool. The first one is it can inject HTA applications. Um, this is like, a, a module is called HTA Drive-By. Um, so you guys remember Java applet attacks? Uh, I, I know I shouldn't say remember because we're still getting into environments using them. But uh, Java applet attacks are basically the de facto go-to standard for penetration testers getting remote access for like 2008 up until like last year. Um, and even then, it still works very regularly, especially if you get a digital code signing certificate and uh, get a valid one, get it authorized by GoDaddy or VeriSign, and then sign your job app, well, it still works. Um, but a lot of browsers now, like if you're looking at Chrome, they'll basically not run Java. You have to go through and configure Chrome to enable, um, I think it's like ISAPI plugins, uh, to execute. And it's becoming less and less of a viable attack method. So HTA is kind of like those Java applet attacks, but with an HTA file. Basically, you go to a website, and it says, hey, you got to download and install this HTML application and run it. And then that HTML application will actually download and execute the malware. So it's very similar to the Java applet attack. So if I'm sitting on the stream, right, man in the middle framework can see an HTTP request and can inject a request to download and execute an HTA file on the fly, which is, which is neat. Now the next one, um, talking about backdooring executables, um, it is just really, really cool. There's a, uh, there was a lot of research that was done, um, and I think they released their presentation at the Infiltrate conference down in Florida dealing with the backdoor framework. And we'll talk about this more here in just a little bit. But what it can do is it can watch for executables floating across the wire, and it can grab those executables, insert backdoors into those executables, and then forward them on to the target. Um, so basically, we can use HTA to drop a new uh, HTTP a uh, application on a system, and we can actually intercept requests as they're going through, grab executables in real time, backdoor the executables, and then drop them on the computer system. Also, there's a um, really cool plugin architecture, architecture um, in BetterCap. It has a number of plugins that are available for arbitrary TCP modification, and it actually has a full TCP proxy. So you can look for certain TCP protocols, and you can redirect it through your proxy, where you can have interception and manipulation scripts uh, set up. If you know Ruby, it's good to go. Snarfing application data. So. With most of these tools, um, like I'll just use BetterCap as an example, it is automatically looking at the traffic and it's trying to harvest things like user IDs, it's trying to harvest passwords, session identifiers, URLs, and so on. So it's going to be seeing that data and it's automatically going to be sniffing it out. It's going to be telling you, hey, this is interesting. Um, an example would be if I go to a website and it's HTTPS, right? And whenever you're testing a website, every once in a while there will be a finding. It'll say the website has secure and insecure elements. And that doesn't sound like that big of a deal. A lot of scanners put it down at like a low or an, even an informational level finding. But if that website is sending you things securely via HTTPS, and then also as part of that stream sending you things insecurely, let's say an image, a lot of times that insecure element that is sent, let's say an image, will have your session identifier in the URL. So Tools like BetterCap will actually flag those things out and say, hey, I've got a clear text HTTP session, and then you would have to go through and look at it and see if there's actually something that's interesting that you could actually jump into. Um, so very, very cool. Um, also, with Man in the Middle Framework, there's an awesome little module called JS Keylogger. Um, that's a JavaScript keylogger, and it'll inject this keylogging code in the HTML as it's going through. So if it sees HTML, it'll inject that JavaScript keylogging code and then anything that is typed within that page that you're going to, uh, like a form element, user ID, password, address, things like that, it'll automatically keylog it and send it to you. Now that code has been around for a while. That's actually in the browser exploitation framework. Um, and you can, you can do that through cross-site scripting attacks for years. But doing this in a man-in-the-middle approach where you can actually fire up a keylogger in the context of the browser is really, really cool. Um, also, it has another cool little plugin called Screenshotter, which involves um, HTML canvas call to take a screenshot of the browser. Now, at that particular point, you're already seeing the raw HTML code, so you could reconstruct it if you wanted, but having something that can generate that 
screenshot on the fly for you is pretty darn nifty, all things told. Also, whenever you're sniffing traffic, if you're using something like ARP spoof, or even if you're using BetterCap, um, well, it'll try to find interesting things for you and bring those things forward. Uh, some other things that you can do is you could run a tool like Explico, um, or you can use Network Miner or something, uh, maybe just doing a full packet capture. And then you could open that packet capture up with something like Explico or Network Miner. And these tools will automatically go through and break down the traffic that was sent between the two systems, from your victim's computer system going out, line, out to the internet. And it'll break it down to make it easier for a bad guy to actually parse through the data. So for example, I can look at images, I can find videos, I can find email messages, voice over IP traffic, uh, file sharing, chat, shells, if there's a shell that's actually going through, and then do some geolocation. And the reason why we prefer to do this whenever we're actually doing assessments and we do man in the middle style attacks is a lot of these tools have great protocol parsers. We're gonna talk about that more here whenever we talk about uh, Responder here in a couple of seconds. But a lot of times the most interesting things that you discover are the things that you didn't know you were looking for. Uh, if you're just looking for straight up HTTP credentials, well maybe there's an FTP credential or maybe, maybe an email message, maybe a voice over IP that you, that's misconfigured so I can play it back because crypto isn't enabled on it properly. Whatever the case is, tools like this, whether you're using Explico or a network miner, make it really easy to parse through the data to see what is actually going on once you're in the middle of the TCP stream. Now let's talk about messing with DNS, but before we do that, Sierra, do we have any questions from any of the uh, any of the attendees? Yeah, we do. We have a couple. Um, so Sweet. Ross says, is, <clears throat> Ross says, is there any reason to use ARP spoof or Man in the Middle framework over BetterCap, or would you say BetterCap is now the new standard? It seems like BetterCap and Beef exploitation framework is now the official standard for Man in the Middle exploitation. You know, Beef and BetterCap, they work very, very well together like peas and carrots because they're both written in Ruby. Um, now, the other thing about it being written in Ruby is, of course, you know, you have that, that really awesome capability of integrating with Metasploit if you choose because Beef can automatically integrate with Metasploit for uh, automatic exploitation. Um, and that's really cool, except if you actually try to do it. Um, if you actually try to set it up, it can actually be quite cumbersome. So the reason why I think BetterCap is taking off and the reason why I think tools like Beef are taking off is because they're easier to install. If you go through, you can install BetterCap on your system with like three commands and it's up and it's running. Um, if you look at Man in the Middle Framework, which I think has more features and I think it's probably a more robust tool by ByteBleeder, it has significantly more steps to actually get it installed. So I personally, um, I, I personally really like Man in the Middle Framework. Uh, just based on what it actually gives you the capability of doing. But I think that BetterCap might win out in the long run just simply because it's so easy to install because it's just basically a simple Ruby installation. Um, so that's, that's my opinion. I'm not saying that one tool is better than the other, but I do know that tools that have more dependencies and more steps to actually get installed tend not to be as heavily used as the tools that are just easy to set up and run. Good question. All right, Sierra, any other questions? Um, Georgie says, does using HTTPS, um, HTTPS fully prevent injection attacks? No, it does not. Uh, great question, talking about HTTPS and injection attacks. A little bit later on this presentation, we're going to talk about SSL strip and SSL strip plus and HSTS by, uh, bypass techniques. And tools like the Man in the Middle framework and even BetterCap have plugins built into them to actually do that type of interception with SSL and uh, using SSL strip plus. A great question. But we'll get to that here in just two shakes of lambs, though. Okay. Um, Maddie says, do we need to be worried about breaking stuff while art poisoning in an engagement? In your experience, what kind of back stuff could happen? So the question was, do we need to be careful about doing uh, ARP cache poisoning during an engagement? What are some bad things that can happen? This presentation will not have a live demo. The reason why it doesn't have a live demo is I found whenever I'm trying to stream, uh, go to webinar, and I start doing ARP cache poisoning attacks, things become unstable, uh, prone to weakness. So whenever we're doing ARP cache poisoning attacks, it does increase the likelihood that something bad is going to happen. I know we had a pen tester when I was working at Northrop Grumman years ago who decided to do ARP cache poisoning on a gigabit switch that had multiple gigabit systems um, and he had it all drop down to his little lonely system and it overloaded the system and it stopped all traffic on the network because the system just couldn't handle it. Uh, when we talk about uh, LLMNR 
poisoning a little bit later, you can do that a little bit more targeted and it tends to have far less of an impact on a network. So I'd recommend that tool instead. And also if you're using something like ARP spoof, you can specify targets. And I would recommend anytime you're doing any of these attacks, specify a single target, target that one system because it's gonna decrease your overall likelihood of system degradation or network degradation. Good question. Um, and one more before we go on, I guess. Uh, are you covering IPv6 today? If not, how much more secure is it? Okay, so when we're talking about IPv6, remember we're talking about broadcast addresses, and IPv6 does support broadcast addresses uh, using multicast and broadcast, so it still applies for IPv6 networks. LLMNNR uh, supports IPv6, and your system will actually downgrade to NBS and or N nbt-ns for NetBIOS if IPv6 is not available because that one works with IPv4 only. So a large amount of these tools work with IPv6 and they'll uh, basically launch the attacks just fine in an IPv6 network. Great question. All right, so we're going to move on. Uh, let's go ahead and let's talk about foiling DNS. All right, so at this particular point, an attacker can be on the network and they're already running an active spoofing program, right? You're trying to resolve a name via DNS, but because I'm on the same network as you, I will see that DNS request. Now, whenever I'm doing DNS attacks, I have to intercept the query ID and I have to intercept the source port. If I can get that query ID, which is a 16-bit uh, identifier, which today is hopefully randomized or pseudo-random, and I see the source port, which is also hopefully pseudo-random as well, I can respond back with a response before the real DNS server responds. So here you have edsbank.com as the request. I see that request and I can respond back to the victim's computer system and say that edsbank.com is at 10.1.1.56. And instead of going to edsbank.com, it's actually going to send them to my attacker's machine where I can actually start doing manipulation and I can attack them as well. So what does this look like? Well, I don't necessarily have to be on the same LAN. I just have to be in between someplace. But once I control DNS, I can redirect traffic anywhere I want to. I could send it through a proxy, grab all the traffic in that particular proxy, do uh, modifications as well. So let me show you what that looks like inside of BetterCap. So within BetterCap, uh, you can see I ran BetterCap, BetterCap space minus X that enables all the sniffing protocols. Uh, and I do dash dash DNS. And anytime you run dash dash DNS, you have to provide it a DNS configuration file. What this is going to do is it's going to start a DNS server on the computer system and it's going to respond based on the rules that you have in your DNS configuration file. And at the bottom of the big screen on the left hand side, upper left, you can see DNS starting on 192.168.2 on port 530, 5300. Now whenever it sees DNS requests coming through, it's going to forward it through and it's going to be looking for very specific domains. So in this particular example that I did uh, this morning is I basically spoofed any request for Microsoft.com to redirect them to Yahoo.com because no one should have to use Bing or Microsoft search engine. So anytime someone does a request for anything Microsoft.com, I can give them an IP address and in this situation, um, Yahoo.com's IP address, which is 98.138.2. 52.30. In my 504 Windows computer system, which I do presentations on, um, I did a look up for Microsoft.com and it looks like this. So um, go to Microsoft.com, the URL says Microsoft.com, but the actual page itself is Yahoo, uh, Yahoo's page. Uh, so I took people from one horrid search engine and I sent them to another horrid search engine, I suppose. I actually like Yahoo. I've been using it for years because I'm old. Um, but that type of redirection, now think about that. Um, you could actually go through and create a cloned website of a bank. And on that website, you could very easily set up a credential capture where it asks for user ID and password. And then you could start harvesting people's user IDs and passwords as they go to that website. Very, very effective. And this takes, with better cap, and this gets back to that, that question, Sierra, that we had a couple of seconds ago, where why do we see a lot of people using better cap and these tools? Well, because it's very easy to install, um, and it's very easy to set up and get it running properly as well. So let's talk about SSL and SSH, because we had a question about that. I think we need to spend some time talking about that. So I need to have DNS spoofing running, and I need to have that kind of ARP cache poisoning attack running on the network as well. So if you're going to a bank, I'm going to send you to a different website. I'm going to send you to a proxy, and I'm going to try to intercept that HTTPS communication 
um, of you trying to go someplace. So I activate DNS spoofing and I activate some type of web proxy program. We're going to talk about what BetterCap has and what uh, Man in the Middle Framework has. We're going to talk about SSL Strip Plus here in just a couple of seconds. But whenever you try to resolve that IP address, you're going to go to my evil IP address because I've already done that DNS spoofing attack. Now, if you can see, I got established the SSL connection. It connects up to my system, I say basically on one side. Now, on the other side of my attacker's computer system, I forward on the request to the real bank, and now I can see absolutely everything in between. Now, it's going to generate errors, and I think this is getting to that question that the student or the, the attendee asked, is they're going to get an error It's going to say the connection is untrusted. They're going to get an error that says there's a problem with this website security certificate. If they're trying to do SSH, they're going to get an error as well. So how do we get around those SSL warnings? Well, there's a couple of things that you can do. The first thing that you could do is try to compromise a CA or a revocation authority, a certificate authority or revocation authority. We saw a situation where DigiNodo was compromised. We saw a situation where Komodo was compromised. Stuxnet had code signing certificates. Uh, Duke or Duku broke into computer systems and stole code signing certificates. You can see a number of different situations where bad guys are trying to gain access to CAs. You can see a number of situations where they're compromising them and then they're generating their own certificates. It's like an intermediary signing certificate so they can intercept anything that they want. Uh, believe it or not, this isn't as hard as one would think it is, like trying to take over a co company for the purposes of trying to take over their certificates. Sounds really hard. It sounds like Mission Impossible or Ocean's Eleven type stuff. Uh, but in real reality, for a lot of the companies that we've tested over the past eight years, it's fairly simple. It's about as hard as to break into a CA as it is to break into pretty much any company, which is which is terrifying. Even more terrifying is how many CAs your browser actually supports. And many browsers support well over a hundred different CAs. Um, so that means that you trust completely every single one of those organizations with all of your traffic and you trust completely every one of those organizations are going to have solid security. Um, the other thing we could do is we can look at vulnerabilities. If you remember like uh, Heartbleed, there's a vulnerability in Apache where we could bleed memory out of the system by basically sending it a heartbeat notification. We would say heartbeat notification, uh, respond back with cat, but I want you to respond back with like, you know, a meg of data. Cat is very small, a meg of data is very large, and in this situation the web server would just grab memory and throw it in the response and send it to you, and you could literally bleed memory off of the computer system. Um, yeah, we still see a lot of systems with heart bleed vulnerabilities in our penetration tests, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's not a Windows computer, it's not as easily patched, people don't really think of it as vulnerable, so that, that one definitely has legs in our penetration test. Other message for SSL warnings, you could try to generate a bogus cert collision. Um, this was done back in 2009. The name of the paper is MD5 to be considered harmful today. They basically clustered like 300 PlayStation 3s together and brute, fi brute forced an MD5 certificate. Um, also, there's been a lot of research over the past couple of years. Um, Ty and Giuliano have been working very, very hard at just basically breaking TLS and SSL. In fact, you shouldn't be using any version of SSL, period, and you should be using only version like TLS version 1.2. We're kind of on the last edge of SSL um, and the last version that we have that's secure, and there's already some some weaknesses that are showing up about that. But, you know, it gets into a bigger question about who we blame for these types of attacks. And you can basically blame a handful of developers at Netscape. Well, it's not entirely their fault. You see, they created SSL as proof of concept code to show that they could do it. And then as it is with almost all proof of concept code, it almost immediately got dropped into production. And, uh, you know, I could just see the developers sitting around and be like, yeah, we can do this. And some manager is like, brilliant, let's put it in production now. And they're like, wait, wait, no, uh, this is just a POC. And I'm pretty sure that half the team was drunk when we wrote this. So uh, we, we need to spend some more time, like, polishing it. And they just ran with it. So, yeah, TLS and SSL have had a number of different vulnerabilities that exist over the past few years. Now, these hard? Well, turns out there's some other options that we can do to avoid these SSL warnings. We could compromise the browser, import the certificate, trick a user into accepting the cert through social engineering, or we can do man-in-the-middle attacks, and we could tell the browser to stay at HTTP and not go to HTTPS. So let's talk about how this works. So <clears throat> whenever somebody goes to a website, 
and it's unencrypted. And there's a link to an encrypted part of the website. Let's go, say you go to a login page, um, or you go to a website for a bank. The main bank's website is clear text HTTP, bad bank, they shouldn't do that. But they have a link that says login. As soon as you hit the login button, it redirects you to an SSL enabled part of their website. It's just something called a 302 redirect. Tools like SSL strip and SSL strip plus They'll look for these redirects when you're going from a clear text HTTP site to an HTTPS site. And then they do something profound and something beautiful. What they do is they take that request and they forward the HTTPS request on your behalf to the bank, right? And then when they receive the data, they strip it back without the SSL and they forward you the HTTP data back to your browser. So as far as your browser is concerned, you never once saw the 302 redirect. You never once got like saw that you hit an SSL page. Everything stayed HTTP because the browser in the or the browser attack in the middle, the bad guy in the middle, basically intercepted everything, stripped away the SSL, and just kept feeding you the raw HTTP, which is of course being sent in clear text. Now you have some kind of protections around the, around this, like HSTS was incorporated to try and stop this, but SSL strip plus um, supports bypass for HSTS um, implementations. Not all implementations, but a good number of those implementations. The problem is, if the bad guy is in the middle, the bad guy can do all kinds of amazing things to shut down any security features that are ultimately trying to make it back to the uh, browser on the far left hand side. Also with SSL strip and SSL strip plus, what they'll do is anytime you see that fave icon, like you know the icon that's in the URL, it'll replace it with a lock. So people are like, oh well, there's a lock. Well this must be a secure connection then. I have absolutely nothing to worry about whatsoever. All right, so before we move on to the hijacking attacks and we talk about Responder and some more things with Man in the Middle Framework, uh, Sierra, do we have any questions? I, yeah, we have a couple. Uh, so, um, Justin Keller says, what's after TLS 1.2? Nothing. Okay. Well, that was a quick answer. <laughs> yep. That's a, that's, a, that's a bad thing, right? Hopefully, hopefully we have top men working on it. The, the top oh, okay, men. the boys right. in the back room. Uh, Marlon back says, room. can you use Explico, I guess that's how you say it, to analyze Wireshark packet capture? Absolutely. Uh, so whenever you do a packet capture with Wireshark or with TCP dump, um, you just want to make sure that you're doing full packet capture. Um, you're not just grabbing like the first 68 bytes, but do a full packet capture, and then you can import it into Explico. You have to create a project, and then you basically give it the path to the file, and it'll ingest it and do analysis for you on the fly. Good question. Um, Ross says, it seems like if you're using the latest version of a modern browser like Chrome with the AT HTTPS extension, you can avoid most of the SSL attacks. Is there any case where this isn't true? Yes, in fact, that's what we're going to be talking about here in just a couple of seconds uh, with modern browsers, especially if we can take advantage of uh, web proxy auto detection and we can give a pack file, we can actually intercept and we can decode URLs, not full intercept as far as I can tell for SSL traffic, but sometimes getting to the URLs is enough, is enough. So very good, good point. Also, it's not necessarily a browser protection. Understand that when we're talking about HSTS, that's something that the server has to have enabled. We can still intercept that in between, and we can still modify it. So it's not necessarily an issue of the browser being more secure. It has to do with the security of the server that you're connecting to. Um, Sin asks, can HPKP help protect against SSL strip attacks? HPKP, I'm not sure. Um, I will say that uh, Moxie Marlin Spike was asked a very similar question a while ago, and uh, Moxie Marlin Spike was the guy that wrote SSL Strip, and they basically came out and said HSTS is the solution for SSL Strip, and Johannes Ulrich from the uh, SANS Institute basically backed that up as well, basically saying that is the specific solution. HSTS was created specifically in response to SSL Strip attacks. Um, and I think um, so. So Sunny asks, "Is there any way to browse safely at all?" Is there any way to browse <laughs> safely? Seems so all? depressing. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, so you must be new here. Um, welcome. Um, this is kind of like <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous for hackers. Uh, it's basically admitting. It's a, basically admitting that uh, we have a problem in the industry. 
Um, basically, you want to make sure that your network connection is somewhat secure. I recommend if you're using something like going to a coffee shop and using an open wireless access point, utilize a VPN. Um, that helps immensely. We're going to talk about defenses here in just a little bit. But yeah, if you're on a network and you don't trust that network, or I'm on the network with you and I have control of the network, there's no way you're going to get out of that situation safely. Um, it, it's just bad, bad, bad all the way around. Good questions. All right, so there's a number of additional other than our poisoning ways that we can hijack systems as well. Uh, we're going to talk about two additional attack vectors because as somebody brought up earlier, uh, ARP cache poisoning attacks across an entire network can definitely lead to some system degradation, um, and that's, uh, that's not cool, right? So we're going to look at a couple of them. We're going to deal with link local multicast name resolution, and we're going to talk about web proxy auto detection. If we're on the network, we can take advantage of systems that are trying to automatically find their proxy, or we can take advantage of systems that are automatically trying to do name resolution uh, because DNS failed them. If we're on that network, we're going to see these broadcast requests looking for these things to find their web proxy auto detection or their link local, multi, link, local, link local multicast name resolution request packets, and we can attack them. So how would we do this? Um, personally, the favorite tool for this is Responder. There's also a PowerShell version of this that was released a while ago. I didn't get it into this presentation, but there's a PowerShell version of it as well. If you just do PowerShell LL, LLMNR poisoning, it'll take you right to the tool, which is pretty neat. And what it does is it watches for those requests, right? So it's looking for MDNS, it's looking for LLMNR, it's looking for, it can also be looked for a, a WPAD requests as well. Um, but it also stands up an HTTP server, an HTTPS server, SQL server, Kerberos server, FTP server, IMAP server, SMTP server, DNS server, and LDAP server. Now the reason for this is if it's going to spoof being a system, it doesn't necessarily know what the victim's trying to do. That victim could be trying to authenticate to the system and use SMB or Kerberos authentication. It could be a web server, right? It could be a web server or an HTTPS based web server. It could be an FTP server. So it has to be ready. So if you're trying to access something, if you're trying to access a service, it's going to pretend to be that system or it's going to redirect you to where that system is. And then it's got to give you a service that you can actually do some interception and grab credentials as well. Um, so this is one of those things that never ceases to amaze me. So I try to go through and do demos and take screenshots and stuff. And uh, this particular tool this morning, whenever I set it up, uh, the time it took for me to install it and run the screenshot and take over my Windows computer system was probably less than five minutes. Um, it was just an incredibly quick uh, process to install it, run it, grab the screenshots. It was, it was over. So this is f really ridiculous. Now, the other thing about this tool that's pretty fantastic is it can also serve up malicious.exe files. Um, which is neat because as you're going someplace, I can give you an executable, and that can be just malware on your system. I can also force downgrade of landman authentication or to landman authentication. Um, so if you're losing something like NTLM v1, NTLM v2, or even using Kerberos, uh, those can be a little bit harder to actually strip out the password hashes. And if you're looking at like uh, NTLM v2, for example, or NTLM, it's sending the NT hash, which is a harder hash to crack especially if the password is a longer password. However, if I can force you to downgrade and use landman authentication, um, as you guys know, landman password hashes are notoriously weak. Splits them up into two seven character sections. They're all converted into uppercase. You can crack every possible landman password in under a day. It's just really, really easy to crack them. And Responder has the capability of actually downgrading those. So this is what it looks like when it runs. So you can run poisoners, uh, LLMNR, you can do MBTNS and DNS and MDNS. So it's going to respond for any of those requests that it sees on the network. And then you can see it started up an HTTP, HTTPS server. It did not do the WPAD attack because I'm doing LLMNR uh, poisoning for this. But you can see all the servers that it kicks up, SMB, Kerberos, SQL, FTP, IMAP, FTP, SMTP, and LDAP. So that's basically trying to serve up and gain credentials for those. Now it does all of this completely on the fly. So this is what it looks like. So what I did, um, let me kind of call this out. You see right here where I did a requested share, right here? So I tried to get to 504 underscore hello. Now 504 underscore hello doesn't exist. It's not a computer system on my network at all. It just isn't. So it tries to jump in and you know, I typed in 504 underscore hello on my Windows computer system, which is my 504 uh, Win computer system. and it sees that NTLM v1 client username and the hash uh, whenever it grabs that. Now I took the hash, it's kind of like fuzzed right here, 
but I took that password hash and fuzzed it because that was my password hash. Um, so we got a poisoned answer that was sent to the, my system and it was trying to find 504 hello and it basically grabbed my Microsoft account, strandjs Gmail, and it grabbed my password hash. And of course you can take that password hash, run it through John the Ripper, OCL, Hashcat, can enable, and then crack the password hash. Hence the reason why I obfuscated it, boys and girls, because I don't want you guys getting direct access to my Microsoft account. Which brings me to another question. When we're talking about that type of remote authentication, right, where people are authenticating online to Microsoft accounts, it's getting to the point where it's no longer an issue of gaining access to that local system. You gain access not just to that local system, but you also gain access to the remote accounts. Once you gain access to the remote accounts from Microsoft, then you can many times jump and gain access to other computer systems as well. But the whole point on this is that 504 underscore hello did not exist. DNS couldn't find it, and then the system dropped down to LLMNR to do the resolution, and Responder was waiting. And as soon as it saw that request, bam, it automatically got the user ID and password. The reason why is because when it tried to go to a system that didn't exist, Responder pops up and says, I am here. I am right here. I am the system you are looking for. So come on over. And as soon as that system came over, it automatically had SMB set up, listening, the system tried to authenticate with its user ID and password, and I'm able to intercept those user IDs and those password hashes, and it's game over. As I said, for me to set this up on a demo system, um, to install a responder, get it up and running, and grab the hashes and the screenshot took me five minutes. Um, and so people are like, hey, why don't you try this for a demo? No, no, no. I have found not to play with these tools whenever you're using things like GoToWebinar and you're doing a webcast for like 370 people. It's a good way to have things go down in flames. So that's why I screenshotted it. All right, so attacking WPAD. Uh, there was some recent research that came out of Black Hat that I think is very applicable to this presentation. Um, stands, WPAD stands, once again, for Web Proxy Auto Detection. So this is something built into Man in the Middle Framework, and it's also built into Responder. How this works is your system's looking for a, name, a system with the name WPAD. Now, you can set this up in your environment legitimately. You can have a system called WPAD.HackedCompany.com, whatever. It's just a WPAD server, right? And any time your systems try to go out to the Internet and a proxy is required, they can automatically come to this WPAD server, and that WPAD server will give them a PAC file. It'll say, hey, here's your proxy. This is where you want to go to get out to the Internet. Now, you can already see where this can go horribly wrong. It's basically looking for any system with the name WPAD. So if I'm on the network and there's a WPAD request, Responder or Man in the Middle Framework will automatically respond and give a quote-unquote malicious PAC file. A malicious PAC file. Now I can basically proxy for all traffic, but as the tool PACDOOR, which was released at Black Hat, also identifies, you can also do a PAC file that's specific for domain. So you can basically say, you use this proxy for this domain, you use this proxy for that domain, and you use this different proxy for that domain over there. Um, it's interesting because in their presentation, they spent a lot of time talking about PAC backdoors, where it's persistent. That PAC file is now installed in the browser, and anytime that browser goes outbound, it then communicates out to these computer systems, and they can actually do a backdoor util utilizing PAC files as well. The other thing that was interesting is they discovered that if I can load a PAC file on a computer system using some DNS, shen DNS shenanigans, I can actually get the full URL for HTTPS traffic. Not a full decrypt of all SSL all traffic, but I can see that URL, the full URL. And that's important because then I can identify things like session identifiers. Um, and many times once I have a session identifier, I then can be you. I don't need to know what your user ID and password is. I am now you on that website. So very, very cool stuff. Check out their work. It's a GitHub Safe Breach Labs, and the name of the tool is Pacdoor. Let's talk about defenses a little bit. Because session hijacking, synthesizing, like sniffing and spoofing, this can be kind of hard. You can hardcore ARP tables for sensitive LANs. Activate port level security on your switches. Uh, that basically means DHCP is only going to come from one system, and ARP responses are going to be tied to specific IP addresses and MAC addresses as well. You want to disable LLMNNR and WPAT on your systems. If you just Google disabling these, it's just a group policy edit that you can push out across your entire environment. For defense against network-based hijacking, as I said, utilizing a VPN is very, very, very helpful because then I'm abstracted a whole nother layer away from the attacker. 
I gain access to the network and immediately open a VPN session. Um, not 100% secure because the bad guy can knock down the, VA, the VPN. Sometimes real time, whenever they're hacking with oven mitts, as we found out with XKCD. Um, but setting up that VPN can be very, very, very helpful as well. Also, if I get access to any one of the hosts, strong authentication encryption fails to help because I'm now sitting on that workstation. Um, identification, um, users lose their session information. You can check ARP entries and validate that the ARP entries, especially for sensitive systems like gateways, actually maps up with what it should be using tools like ARP Watch, looking at DNS cache as well. Containment, you want to drop any spurious network connections, of course, uh, and carefully analyze systems. But here's the kick in the teeth. If a bad guy was able to get on one of your systems and the bad guy had the capability of running a sniffer or running any number of these tools, the bad guy most likely had root or administrator level privileges on that box. That box is now completely untrustworthy. There's nothing that can be trusted at all. It's basically nuke that box from high orbit because it is ultimately the only way to be sure. We're going to have to nuke it and rebuild the box from scratch. Also, we're going to want to go through and we're going to want to change the password for root and administrator accounts across any other system that may have had those same administrative accounts as well. And that is it. All right. So I want to hand it back over to Sierra. Sierra, what do we have for um, what do we have for questions from the audience? Okay, so one from a little earlier from Ken says, uh, it seems to have been a couple of recent side channel vulnerabilities, um, heist RFC 5961 Linux. How big a deal are these compared to man in the middle? I think that they're in the same class in the same category. Now, side channel attack is basically where you can intercept the traffic and you can do um, you can do some decryption of the encrypted data. A lot of the attacks like Beast kind of falls into that category as well. They're definitely in the same category. I'm on the same network as you and I can side jack that session. Um, but it requires, of course, I need to get access to some unencrypted elements as well to actually execute some JavaScript for some of the web-based attacks. So yeah, it's definitely in that category. And the tools that we talked about here weren't meant to be exhaustive. It was just meant to be kind of a sampling of the tools that I like quite a bit. Um, there's a whole bunch of other tools out there. But the point is, if I'm on the network with you, yeah, I've got all kinds of fantastic things that I can do. Uh, cool. OK, so Steiner says, is ZARP a really an option to detect ARP spoofing? Yes, there are a number of tools. I prefer ARP Watch. Um, basically what happens, um, and even in that, you can enable ARP protection on many of the modern enterprise level switches. And basically what they do is they say, okay, well, this is the IP address, MAC address, port pairing in the content addressable memory table on the switch. And it says, okay, at this point, this is where the gateway is. And it learns that. If all of a sudden there's a new system that pops up and all of a sudden it's trying to be the gateway, it'll actually knock that down. Um, so there's a lot of open source tools out there that you can sit on the network and they can watch for ARP requests. And if all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of weird ARP requests, they'll notify you that there's some shenanigans that are being played or they're going to keep like an ARP table as far as which systems are associated with which MAC addresses, which IP address is associated with which MAC addresses. And there's tools like Forescout which do this very, very, very well um, on the commercial side uh, that can shut down a lot of these ARP cache poisoning attacks. Good question. Um, and then Emra, I hope I said that right, is, says, is there any exact solution for LLMNR and BSNS poisoning? Yes, you can disable it. Um, in fact, I think I might have that group policy. Nope. Um, edit. I go to GP edit. Dot. See if I can get this up and running. Uh, let's see if I can find it because it's in this nightmare. Um, for looking at it, I got administrative networks, and it's in here somewhere. Um, it's not network isolation. What is it? Um, here it is. Um, while you're looking for that, we have a couple people that have asked if it's going to be recorded. Yes, we record yes. all our webcasts, and they it will be available in a few days. So don't worry if you had to miss it or something. And hooray, I was able to pull it from memory. Um, so if you want to disable LLMNR, um, you fire up gpedit.msc, and you go to Administrative Templates, Network, DNS Client, and then once you're into DNS client, you go all the way to the bottom right here, and there's a setting called turn off multicast name resolution, 
and you can set that to enabled and it'll actually shut it off. I know that that seems weird, but enabling this shuts off multicast name resolution and uh, you, you can actually see that it talks about it right here. It specifies the link local and link local multicast name resolution is disabled on the client and that shuts it down. Um, cool. Okay, so then another question from Ross. I know you recommended using VPN to protect against this type of attack. Is there anything like BetterCap, MITMF that actually spoofs a VPN? Um, okay, so that's a lot more difficult. Not impossible, but it's a lot more difficult because if you set up a VPN appropriately, there's a certificate exchange, and unless they actually have access to that certificate, for most VPNs, not all, they won't be able to actually do a full interception of the VPN traffic. Um, so a VPN set up properly, as quite a few of them that we come across are, will use some certificates. That means that the client certificate um, basically will be on the server, and the server will give a server certificate to the client, and unless those certificates match up, the encryption's not going to work, the VPN's not going to fly. Um, if you want to look at an attack against that, we did a webcast. If you just go to the StrandJS Gmail uh, YouTube channel, we did a webcast on a zero day that we found in FatPipe VPNs, where we were able to pull the, uh, the, the key uh, for basically intercepting those VPN communications. So we had a whole other video talking about intercepting that, but it basically was Joff exploiting a vulnerability in the FatPipe VPN itself, which is now fixed. Um, but yes, you can do that, but it requires a vulnerability. For most VPNs, it's a lot harder to do. Um, awesome, and I guess we have time for one. Sorry, we didn't get to all of your questions, but um, Adele has one more maybe. So would you recommend setting this up when you pen test? My concern is what's the probability of people searching for the wrong URL or the wrong network path? Um, this is one of those things that you actually set up during the pen test and let it run. Um, you'd be surprised. There's a lot of references to hosts that no longer exist. So if you have a standard desktop image and they had a help desk server 01, help desk server 01 was removed, but all the systems try to mount a share to help desk 01 because that's the first share that they mounted when they were baby computers just coming into the world, and now it's help desk 02, they'll still constantly look for help desk 01. Um, so as soon as the system is retired, anything that's looking for that, you'll be able to do that LLMNR poisoning. So the question is, how effective is it? I would say about 50% of our internal pen tests, once we get access, it is an effective approach for actually attacking systems. And I okay, think that's looks it looks like we're out of time now. All right. Well, thank you so much. As Sierra mentioned, this will be recorded. It will be archived. If you want to see all the rest of our videos, just go to StrandJS Gmail um, for, and YouTube, and you'll be able to pull those down. And also be checking out the BlackHillsInfosec.com blog. Uh, we greatly appreciate your time today. And with that, get out of here, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.